Today we embark on a chilling journey into a darker side of Detroit's past, where tragedy unfolded one summer night in 1971, leaving eight dead, many unanswered questions, and a lingering sense of mystery. Join me as we seek to shed light on a chapter in Detroit's history that remains shrouded in the shadows of uncertainty. This is the story of the Hazelwood Massacre. In 1971, Detroit was a city marked by significant socioeconomic challenges and was undergoing a transformative period. The automobile industry, which had long been the backbone of Detroit's economy, faced considerable decline, leading to high unemployment rates and economic hardship. Combined with broader economic issues, the decline of the auto industry also had far-reaching effects on the city's infrastructure, leading to abandoned buildings and urban decay. The city grappled with racial tensions and the aftermath of the civil unrest in the late 1960s, including the infamous 1967 Detroit riots. Crime rates were on the rise. This period marked the beginning of a decline in the city's population as residents sought better opportunities elsewhere. It was against this backdrop that the Hazelwood Massacre added a layer of tragedy and mystery to Detroit's already complex history. It is unclear when Robert Gardner, 28, and his wife Andrea, 22, moved into the first floor apartment of the red brick house located at 1970 Hazelwood Street. The owner of the property would state that he was unaware they were living there and thought the apartment was vacant. Records from the Michigan Bell Telephone Company, however, would indicate that a telephone had been installed in Robert's name sometime in the 10 days preceding the murders. Neighbors described them as a pleasant couple who had moved in recently, and they also reported that young people had recently been seen going in and out of the house during the night. Robert was a convicted felon and known to be heavily involved in the lower echelons of the national drug trade. The year prior to the murders, Andrea had escaped from the Detroit House of Corrections while serving a sentence for passing bad checks. In the early morning hours of June 14, 1971, the gardeners would have seven visitors, presumably there to use heroin. Catherine Winston, age 19, Narcissa Brown, age 19, Catherine Basser, age 22, Sharon Brown, age 20, Carl Mounts Jr., age 27, Lloyd Tyler, age 27, and Ramondell Burton, age 24. Shortly before 4.30 a.m., police began receiving calls from neighbors who heard gunshots coming from the apartment. They also received a call from Andrea who reported that she had entered the house, found her husband had been shot, and drove him to Henry Ford Hospital. She reported to police, there's a bloodbath in that house and you better send some police. Police arrived to find a truly horrifying scene. All seven visitors were shot in the head at close range. Cartridges were recovered from guns from three different calibers, a 30 caliber carbine, a 32 caliber pistol, and a 45 caliber automatic. Later, police would come to believe that five guns had actually been used. All of the bodies were found in the living room. Three of the women were on the couch, and the fourth woman was near the couch. Three of the women had their hands tied in front with rubber surgical tubing. Two of the men appeared to have been sitting on the floor and their heads fell into the fireplace after being shot. Another was leaning against the couch. They all appeared to be in relaxed positions, apparently unaware of the danger. Robert was shot in the mouth, chest, and stomach. He fell approximately 10 feet from the door. Police later theorized that he had answered the door and was shot as he backed away from the shooters. He was taken to Henry Ford Hospital by Andrea before police arrived on scene, where he would die from his wounds six days later on June 20th. Three other occupants of the apartment, two women and one man, had apparently escaped by breaking through the rear window of a sun porch and fleeing down the alley. They would later come to police headquarters to report the massacre. These three individuals have never been publicly identified. Inside the apartment, police found five handguns, five long guns, and a shotgun none of which had been fired recently. Police also found packets of a substance believed to be heroin, as well as paraphernalia, including spoons, tinfoil, and hypodermic needles. A total of $673 in cash was found on the victims. A city cab driver radioed his dispatcher at 4.30 a.m. and stated, seven or eight people have been murdered on Hazelwood, and I'm looking at them right now. The dispatcher attempted to radio the driver back, but got no answer. This cab driver was never identified, and how he came to be at the crime scene is unknown. Four men were seen fleeing the house, and witnesses described them as wearing windbreakers and tam-o'-shanter hats. 
Vera Gibson, who lived directly above the grisly crime scene with her husband and children, reported waking to the shattering of glass, presumably from the survivors breaking the sun porch window, followed moments later by gunshots. She also reported that Andrea had run upstairs, stating that her husband had been shot. However, the Gibsons, having no telephone, were unable to summon help. A team of 20 detectives, led by homicide inspector James Bannon, was assigned to the investigation. Bannon painted the apartment as a suspected narcotics den, linking four of the seven victims to criminal records in narcotics and prostitution. Labeling it an execution-type slaying, the police dismissed the notion of robbery due to money and drugs at the scene. The initial theory of revenge against Robert for selling fake heroin gained traction, supported by the discovery of a substance initially believed to be heroin, but later revealed as milk, sugar, and quinine. The investigation's focus shifted towards Robert as the primary target, with the other victims eliminated to silence potential witnesses. Police later began pursuing leads indicating that Robert may have robbed other drug dealers. The Hazelwood Massacre remains the worst mass killing in Detroit's history. It was part of a record year for murders in Detroit, many tied to drug wars with the final death toll for 1971 reaching 690. During the 1970s, Detroit led the nation in homicides and became known as Murder City. No one has ever been arrested, and this case remains open. In the shadowy echoes of these killings, we find ourselves at the crossroads of mystery and tragedy. The chilling events of that fateful night in 1971 have left us with more questions than answers, a haunting enigma that continues to elude resolution. While these victims may not have been pillars of the community, they were still sons and daughters, sisters and brothers. This story of lives cut short and the lingering mysteries challenge us to confront the darker corners of human nature in the pursuit of justice. Until next time, stay curious, stay vigilant, and may the truth reveal itself in the shadows.